I wonder if you've ever heard of Nonamesset Island? Well, I hadn't until I started researching the story that I'm about to tell you. But it's not surprising if you haven't heard its name. It only covers approximately half a square mile and was uninhabited as recently as the year 2000. It's the easternmost island in a chain called the Elizabeth Islands, which lie close to the coast of Massachusetts, northeast of New York City. It takes about four and a half hours to drive there from central Manhattan. You're more likely to be familiar with the neighbouring island close by. Martha's Vineyard, just across the water to the south, has been a holiday destination for the Obamas, the Clintons, the Kennedys and many Hollywood stars. It's where Spielberg shot the film Jaws. So why have I mentioned this little known place? Well, in 1840 it was the birthplace of a man who would later become a renowned artist. This is the house where he was born. At the age of two, his family moved on to the mainland, to the whaling port of New Bedford, not far away. And when he was an adult, he bought a summer house on the coast at nearby Nonquit. The property looks dismal and desolate in this black and white photograph. Much of his work focused on the landscapes of New England, although he also travelled abroad to paint in Britain, France, Italy, Spain, Morocco and Egypt. You're looking at some samples of his work. He was largely self-taught and inspired by places close to the sea, especially expressive, moody landscapes. In 1864 he opened a studio in Boston and two years later he moved to New York City. Nowadays you'll find some of his paintings hang in the most prominent galleries from San Francisco to New York and the Smithsonian in Washington DC. He was a member of the Society of American Artists and his name was Robert Swain Gifford. On the 15th of January 1905 he died aged 65 and was buried here in this simple grave leaving a widow who continued to live in the home undisturbed. His death is important for this story, which also involves a man by the name of Frederick Louis Thompson, another native of New Bedford, born 28 years after Gifford, who also moved to New York as an adult. Thompson worked as a trophy designer, engraver and a modeler in silver and gold. He worked for Tiffany and other jewellers before setting up on his own. He had no training as an artist, but around the middle of 1905, at the age of 36, he was inexplicably seized by an impulse to sketch and paint pictures. This was surprising as he had no real interest in art beyond the engraving needed for his goldsmith profession. But he showed skill and talent. He told his wife that he sometimes felt he was a man named Gifford and would say to her, Gifford wants to sketch. So you can appreciate that in January 1906, with a Gifford exhibition being held at an art gallery in New York, Thompson would go to it. While looking at one of the works, he says he heard a voice in his ear. You see what I have done, it said. Can you not take on and finish my work? He learned that Gifford had died a year earlier, and six months after his death, he had developed his own urge to paint in the Gifford style. Indeed, over time, this impulse grew stronger, resulting in paintings of sufficient artistic merit to command a fair price. You're now looking at a short selection of his artworks. However, he did not reveal Gifford's influence to anyone except his wife. Even so, one art connoisseur told Thompson independently that his work resembled Gifford's, and he even sold a painting to the author Mark Twain. I should mention here that Thompson had met Gifford a few times, but that this had not amounted to much. He saw the artist years earlier, when he was hunting in the marshes around New Bedford. He came across Gifford sketching on three occasions, and on one of these the two men spoke for a few minutes. Thompson also called on Gifford to show him some jewellery, but other than that the men did not meet socially. 
For Thompson, being obsessed by a dead artist was a problem. He was having visions and hallucinations, hearing voices and music, and felt compelled to find the scene of some gnarled old oak trees that he kept seeing in his mind in order to paint them. He was haunted, overwhelmed, and his compulsion to paint was detracting from his goldsmith profession. Two physicians diagnosed him as paranoid. So, in January 1907, Thompson turned up on the doorstep of this man, Professor James Hislop. Formerly Columbia University's Professor of Logic and Ethics, he was also the founder and director of the American Institute for Scientific Research, devoted to abnormal psychology and psychical research. Hislop stated in his book Contact with the Other World, Mr. Thompson came to me with the fear that his visions and hallucinations were threatening his sanity. So the two men formed a partnership to try to sort out this malady. At first, the professor was inclined to think him mentally disturbed and decided to check out the Gifford connection by taking him to a clairvoyant medium. Now, at this point, I think we need to distinguish between spirit possession and the process of obsession, which is not quite the same thing. In cases of possession, the intruding entity displaces the victim from his own body and obtains direct control of it, as in the What Seek or Wonder case that I've discussed in another YouTube video. In cases of obsession, the victim remains in control of his or her own body, but the intruding entity influences the mind, establishing a sort of parasitic relationship, able to modify thoughts and actions in line with its own wishes. The victim becomes aware of being overshadowed by another personality, resulting in mental disturbance and delusions. So Hislop introduced Thompson to three different mediums for sittings on different occasions. Unfortunately, I've been unable to find photographs of these people. The first medium was given a pseudonym, Mrs Rathbun, but is believed to have been Margaret Gall. She described Gifford's birthplace and mentioned a group of oak trees that Thompson recognised as the ones that he'd been visualising for over a year and still wanted to paint, although the medium was unable to provide the location. But she did state that a boat was needed to get there. Thompson felt encouraged by this first sitting and decided to continue painting. At the same time, he provided Professor Hislop with some sketches that he'd already crafted under Gifford's influence. Hislop noted and locked them away. The Professor then arranged a sitting with Minnie Soul, also known as Mrs Chenoweth, regarded as the most talented medium of her day. She went into a trance before Thompson was allowed into the room, so she never actually met him in person. She provided 20 pieces of information, suggesting that Gifford was communicating from the other side, and she revealed that the artist was elated over his power to return and finish his work through Thompson. Also, Minnie Soul referred to a group of oak trees, just as Mrs Rathbun had done. When Thompson asked for the location, she described how to get there, but the name of the place was not given. Thompson speculated that the scene of these oak trees might be near Gifford's summer home at Nonquit. But Gifford's widow, with whom he was in contact, said her husband's favourite place was actually on one of the Elizabeth Islands, Nashawina. While visiting Mrs Gifford, she showed Thompson around her husband's former studio, which was little changed since his death. And Thompson was shocked to see three paintings there that were virtual mirror images of ones that he'd already sketched during his hallucinations. On an easel was a painting that was a virtual copy of a sketch that he had deposited with Professor Hislop over a month earlier. Here is that sketch and this is the finished painting on the easel of the same scene by Gifford. And here's another example. This is a sketch drawn by Thompson from an hallucination, while this shows his hallucination accurately reflected a location.
But was Thompson being honest or a trickster? At a sitting with Mrs Rathbun, she made the following statement. You have been questioned regarding your honesty. So far as intuitions, impressions, and some might say hallucinations, you have a very peculiar power. Thompson took Mrs Gifford's advice and visited Nashawina, where he found the old oak trees. The information given by the mediums on how to get there had been accurate, as checked and confirmed by Professor Hislop. So here are two pictures. This one shows the oak trees from Thompson's hallucination in August 1905, while this one is a later painting once the real trees had been found. It's now clear that Gifford had impressed a real location onto Thompson's mind. And there were other scenes on the island Thompson had already sketched or painted from his mind's eye without having seen them in reality. But there they were, for real. While viewing these, he heard a voice similar to the one that he'd perceived at the art gallery in New York. Go and look at the other side of the tree, it said. So he did and found Gifford's initials carved into the bark of a beech tree, dated 1902. On Professor Hislop's inspection of the same location, he concluded Thompson could not have recently carved these initials himself in order to deceive anybody, given their obvious age. In a further sitting with Mrs Rathbun, Hislop noticed use of the Latin phrase alter ego to describe the influence affecting Thompson and these very same words were repeated at another sitting with Minnie Soul. But despite the information coming from these mediums, Gifford's name was never explicitly mentioned. So Professor Hislop employed a new medium, Mrs Willis Cleveland, known as Mrs Smead. He was concerned that Thompson's obsession was becoming public knowledge, so he sent for Mrs Smead from a southern state where she lived 13 miles from a railway station and where she could not possibly have learned about the case. The first sittings failed to provide the spirit communicator's identity, then in automatic writing RG yes and then RGS was produced. The initials of Robert Swain Gifford, but in the wrong order. Then finally a sitting occurred where the initials RSG were given in the correct order. This identified Gifford as the influence acting on Thompson, a true case of obsession, and it closed the case. Hislop pointed to the spirit hypothesis and he recommended serious inquirers go to his detailed report on the evidential nature of the facts. There are far more details in it than I have related here. To check out this story for yourself, go to Hislop's 1919 book entitled Contact with the Other World. It's available from Amazon in up-to-date printings and as a free of charge download on the internet. You will want to view pages 203 to 230. In later years, Frederick Thompson's life took a bizarre twist. He stopped painting altogether, and in 1925 his marriage fell apart. Four years later he was arrested on two counts of the attempted murder of his wife Caroline. She alleged that he had hit her, tried to choke her, smash her head on a rock, tried to poison her with arsenic-laced fruit and candy, and otherwise threatened to kill her. She obtained a divorce on the grounds of cruelty. He alleged that she was having an affair with an 83-year-old wealthy socialite named Colonel Brooks, with whom they'd both spent their summers from 1911 to 1925. He filed a half million dollar lawsuit against the Colonel. Thompson was sent to the Massachusetts Hospital for the Criminally Insane, probably this one in Bridgewater, and then he awaited trial in Edgartown Jail on Martha's Vineyard. Thompson claimed that Caroline's evidence was forged and he was acquitted on both counts. So he sued his former wife and her alleged lover for a million dollars in damages, but was awarded just $76,000 in 1930. 
Later, this award was overturned. Caroline countersued Thompson for a million dollars on the grounds that he had annoyed her to an unbearable degree. As one commentator put it, there was no concealing these were peculiar people engaged in peculiar goings-on. Well, I think we can agree about that. However, at sales today, Thompson's paintings still sell for thousands of dollars apiece. He died in 1933, aged 65, the same age as Gifford when he met his demise. Thanks for listening.